Thank you so much for the, the introduction um, and thank you for everyone uh, coming along today uh, and potentially those watching on YouTube. Um, look, today the topic is yeah, on the statistics of deposit insurance and for me it is a, it's, it's a fascinating um, interlinkage of a few different topics. Um, so for me, my, my background, I, I started off in a national statistical organization. So I view myself uh, as a trained statistical methodologist and in my heart, I think I still am. Um, but then I moved into central banking um, after that, working on um, macroeconomic issues. And now um, at the, the Swiss-based standard setter for deposit insurance around the world. So here is the intersection of all these um, sort of key areas, in my opinion. Um, and today it's going to be a little bit of a, I suppose, an introduction to deposit insurance for those that may not be overly familiar with um, what these frameworks entail. Um, there'll be some economics, of course, and then we'll, um, we'll roll into the statistics, um, which I'm hoping interest the RSS members that um, are, are playing along here. Um, in terms of what are some of the key trends we're seeing in the sector, uh, what are the key messages that come out of that? So let's move on. So the obligatory disclaimer, the, the views expressed today are, are my own personal views and not necessarily those of uh, my employer, the International Association of Deposit Insurers, or IARDI for short, um, its members, associates, or partners. So I've already alluded to this, but what will I present? So. It is the finance and economic section of the Royal Statistical Society. So I'll cover the, the economics and then I'll cover the statistics and I'll probably go back and forth a, a few times as well. So if you, you find there's a bit too much economics, just wait um, and we'll get to the statistics uh, and vice versa. So um, that's sort of broadly uh, the approach I had in mind. I just want to make sure that there is sufficient context here because I think that the statistics, the statistics I'm going to present only are really meaningful as all statistics are only meaningful with, with appropriate context. And in this instance, given um, you know, recent developments in the global financial sector, um, deposit insurance has emerged as um, a really key topic on the, on the tip of a number of economists' tongues at the moment. So um, I'm hoping that you come out of this presentation with a a decent first level understanding of deposit insurance and then hopefully some key takeaways on, on what's going on in the industry. So um, a little bit about IARDI, so my employer and the IARDI core principles. So IARDI is essentially just a forum of deposit insurers all over the world. Um, so we have 94 members currently and a number of other associates and partners and the objective of having a forum such as IARDI is multifaceted. It's about sharing expertise. It's about learning from each other, of course. We, we meet regularly within IARDI um, in various parts of the world to, to share experiences. Um, there's a training and, and education component where we have um, experts based here in Basel that um, are in charge of ensuring our members get the latest training in deposit insurance and understanding best practice from that perspective. And then the other side is sort of where I'm more closely involved in, and that's in the research analysis and, and ultimately guidance component um, of deposit insurance. So we, we publish papers regularly. Um, we're also working on um, essentially updating and clarifying the rules um, that govern how a deposit insurer should be constructed, um, how design features should be configured uh, to ensure optimal outcomes for, um, for a deposit insurance framework. So in 2009, IARDI and the, the Basel Committee for, for Banking Supervision, so the Basel Committee essentially sets the global standards for, for banks. Um, we worked with them collaboratively to develop the IARDI core principles for effective deposit insurance system. And so it's this document and more importantly, the, adop the adoption of the principles within this document um, you know, that governs the, uh, that, that presents the standards, I suppose, for deposit insurance. Um, these have been in place since 2009. We've updated them once in 2014, and we're always exploring uh, avenues um, to ensure that our, our 
core principles are, are up to date and robust. So the core principles are a really important part of this whole discussion because they, they just frame, um, they, they frame the way deposit insurance um, is used in terms of benchmarking. Um, it enables there to be a common vernacular, a common set of terms, a common set of phrasing that allows deposit insurers to engage with each other, um, to help identify gaps in their systems, and ultimately to, um, to work on addressing those gaps or working on getting the necessary, necessary support domestically to um, go about filling those gaps. Um, given that these rules are global standards, the core principles are a global standard, they have to be extremely robust, but also broad enough to capture such a, a wide range of, of jurisdictions, specific considerations. Um, in, in my day-to-day -day work, I encounter deposit insurers all over the world that have particularly different um, political considerations at play domestically, dramatically different legal frameworks, um, banking sectors that, um, I mean, you wouldn't believe unless you've, unless you've actually seen them. There's some really fascinating elements at play. And um, so these core principles have to be suitably um, broad and general to allow us to then um, go ahead and, and ensure that they can be applied in, um, in a global context. So as I've alluded to, deposit insurance is, is somewhat sexy at the moment. Um, and in part, it's because of the, the, the relatively recent announcement of the Nobel Prize winners. So the Memorial Prize in Economics um, was won by um, Douglas Diamond and Phil Dibfig. And essentially their seminal piece from 1983 revolved around, uh, amongst other things, the, um, the optimal design of deposit insurance and thinking about ways in which deposit insurance can help uh, ensure financial stability and protect depositors. Um, we were fortunate to actually have um, Professor Diamond join us for a presentation only a few weeks ago. Um, it was quite an exciting development within the industry because it's, it's recognition that deposit insurance is a, is a crucial element of the financial sector safety net. And we'll unpack this a little bit further um, throughout the talk, but um, it's tremendous recognition along with, the, uh, with Ben Bernanke, the former uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, um, that this is an area of economics um, and a public policy more broadly um, that is, is really critical. Um, both now and moving into the future. So, all right, what is deposit insurance? Now, generally speaking, deposit insurance is, and I'll emphasize the bold words here, it's privately financed. So it's a privately financed scheme to insure deposits in the event of a bank failure. So the banks essentially pay for this insurance themselves. This is not there's a distinction here between government bailouts, which were something that was um, a very topical element in, in, in the wake of the uh, 2008 global financial crisis. Deposit insurance is not a bailout. Deposit insurance is privately financed cover for depositors. The deposit insurance scheme's purpose, so it's twofold, and this is codified in our core principles as well, and it's to protect depositors, but also to ensure financial stability. They are extremely closely connected, of course, those two ideas, but they don't always lead to, um, well, they don't always lead to intuitive outcomes in the sense that you can seek to address one of these and potentially compromise another with a particular tool or, or, or approach. So we'll come back to this a little bit more detail, but these are the dual objectives of a uh, deposit insurance system, protecting depositors and ensuring financial stability. Um, deposit insurance is also looking to avoid systemic implications for financial systems. So systemic has a very particular meaning in this context. It means that um, deposit insurers want to ensure that a bank failing doesn't necessarily lead to other broader and potentially more catastrophic implications for a financial system. Um, and so there have been many historical instances of one bank failing and that then leading to many others falling as well, this domino effect. And in this day and age where banks own shares in each other, um, 
it's it's something that we really want to be conscious of, ensuring that um, we, we carefully manage systemic implications. And the larger banks um, are often those which are the most systemic. We can come back to that again. Um, we're also looking to see um, to reduce the likelihood of depositors running their bank. So that is depositors losing confidence in their bank. And when they do, they essentially withdraw their funds. And um, a sudden and coordinated withdrawal of funds at scale um, leads, of course, to liquidity issues for a bank, which ultimately can exacerbate problems. Um, and in some sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, I suppose, it can, it can lead to um, you know, significantly adverse outcomes in that regard. So these are all things that the positive insurance uh, that is looking to sort of guard against. A little bit of a sort of to come back to statistics a little bit. So here's a, a little bit of a game to play, I suppose. We've got a graph here. I've cut out a little bit of the graph and it's, it's just, it's just the share price over time. And I, I, I thought this is a good example of where um, all those time series methods that you learned at university, um, you know, may, may suggest you forecast forward um, you know, you may, if you detrend it, it looks broadly stationary. You know, the autocorrelation is, I suppose, mostly correlated with the lag. Um, you might use an ARIMA forecasting approach. You might uh, you might look at um, volatility as, as an alternative, given it is a share price, and go through a, a Garch framework. And um, yeah, this is real world data. This uh, this inf this this was a, a company that existed. Um, 2005, 2007 here. Um, your expectations on where this share price is going are one thing, and then you've got the reality. Um, so the reality here, this is Northern Rock. So it's a, it's a well publicized um, failure that occurred in the UK. Um, so when depositors saw this happen, um, in particular, this very, very sudden drop in share price, I mean, they lost all confidence and confidence is everything in financial markets. Um, it often drives prices, it drives volatility. Um, many in the community, many customers were scared, quite frankly. And so that led to this. And so there's some well, well known, um, you know, it's well documented, I suppose, this instance. Um, queues in front of the bank. This is the definition of a, the, the traditional definition of a bank run. Um, individuals queuing outside their bank, looking to withdraw their cash, that merely exacerbates problems. And at the time it led to the, uh, the UK government needing to intervene significantly. Um, a few things just to point out here about this group. Um, typically those that, that run a bank um, are the most vulnerable in society. Um, they tend to be in lower socioeconomic strata, tend to be older, they tend to be um, those with, uh, lower levels of household wealth. They tend to be those that have got lower levels of education. And so a bank run is for a multitude of reasons, not a good thing. And so deposit insurance um, in conjunction with the financial sector safety net more broadly um, is concerned with ensuring this doesn't happen. Now the world has changed and a bank run these days doesn't require any queuing up anymore. So um, there have been recent instances where significant liquidity has been extracted from a bank very, very quickly, and no one had to go out and queue up like this anymore. So the world is a little bit different, but fundamentally the problem remains the same. We're looking to ensure that those with deposits in a bank, potentially your life savings in a bank, um, have confidence that even in the event of um, an adverse outcome, that they are protected and they don't have any need to queue up like these unfortunate um, individuals in 2008. Okay, so that's sort of the, the pretext of why depositor insurance exists, why I do what I do. Um, so how does it work? Um, so deposit insurance is usually supported by some sort of legislation um, and those that are licensed to take deposits, so I'll refer to them here as deposit taking institutions. So these are licensed institutions. They may include banks, credit unions, building societies, financial cooperatives, 
in some in, in some jurisdictions e-money issuers they are all required to take out insurance through the deposit insurer and it gets tied to their banking license in most instances um, it's it's a, a mandatory requirement it's part of their um, part of the supervisory regime so these institutions take out insurance and essentially that means the depositor gets coverage this coverage is in most instances finite it's limited you don't have an unlimited coverage scenario scenario in in most jurisdictions and we can come back to why that is the case shortly um, usually the coverage that's offered to depositors is by depositor and by institution and in a lot of other cases it can there can be other different breakdowns um, but broadly speaking um, there is a some sort of limit that exists in um, each bank account um, or sorry each for each depositor per bank so the deposit insurer um, to finance this insurance levies premiums on the deposit taking institutions so these DTIs then essentially have to pay an amount of money every quarter whatever it may be and this premium that they're charged is broadly speaking proportional to the the risk that they expose the deposit insurance fund to so a larger dti will will typically pay a higher premium um, in some jurisdictions there are risk-based premium systems where uh, a very comprehensive assessment of risk is conducted and those that are deemed more risky will actually have to pay proportionately more given that once again they um, uh, I suppose increasing the overall likelihood of um, the deposit insurance fund being required to finance um, a resolution activity. Um, and again, to reiterate what I said earlier, essentially means it's privately financed. So the, um, there is no bailing out by the taxpayer. And that is a really important message to get across. It's something that um, after the global financial crisis, um, many on the legislative side and, and policy, other policy makers were very concerned to ensure that um, ideally taxpayers were not footing the bill um, for DTIs that uh, fail for whatever reason. Um, so this fund supports intervention measures uh, and that could include the reimbursement of insured uh, deposits to depositors um, and other resolution activities, which I can touch upon soon. So. Okay, so what happens here? Now, in the instance of a, a DTI failing, there are three broad things that occur um, within the context of deposit insurance. Either the insured deposits are reimbursed. So in that instance, what will happen is there'll be some trigger, some trigger of non-viability of the bank, which the supervisor will declare that a deposit insurer will then come in and say, well, okay, let's identify who is affected. Uh, let's work out what each of the bank balances are that enable us to work out um, the extent of impacts on each individual. And then through various means, they will then return the funding to them based on or well, extracting it from this deposit insurance fund. So in some parts of the world, um, that involves transfer of the insured funding into a, a bank account at another bank or another financial institution. Um, so that involves contact with the uh, affected depositor in parts of um, sub-Saharan Africa. There'll be a, a cash um, reimbursement. That's very common in lots of different parts of the world still, particularly when you've got low balances at play. Um, other places, they'll write you a check um, and send it to your home um, based on details that uh, are on record by the, uh, the affected institution. And so there's a number of different innovations in that space in terms of ways to quickly, accurately, efficiently um, return funds to those that um, are affected to ensure minimal disruption um, uh, to their banking experience. Another model that is used is that the, the deposit taking institution that's failing will be acquired. And this acquisition will be by another institution within the industry, essentially a competitor. Um, there are a variety of approaches that are used to facilitate such a, a, a purchase and assumption transaction. Um, in instances where there are a significant number of competitors within an industry, there'll be a, a bidding process of sorts. And that won't necessarily see that the highest bid getting um, the opportunity to acquire this bank, but it'll, it'll be an instance where the, those making decisions about 
who should acquire this bank will make an assessment of how um, likely um, these assets are to be utilised in an effective way um, and the broader implications of financial stability. So um, this is a, a common mechanism and often the deposit insurance fund in this instance is utilised to potentially repackage the balance sheet somewhat. So to um, adjust the balance sheet in a way that makes it somewhat more enticing to borrow. So that will mean writing off some components of this balance sheet that are less desirable for lots of reasons, given the bank has failed. Um, and so that repackaging um, can then enable competitors to come in and, and purchase uh, these customers. And in this instance, the depositor really won't feel any difference whatsoever. They will just see that their, their bank branch on Monday will have a, a different name on it. It will be a, a new bank, a new bank, and, and otherwise their um, um, their experience with the financial service provider is, is seamless. There are other resolution options at play, but um, I, I won't cover those today. Um, as I've been in the news lately, we can talk about those. But ultimately, the important thing here is that the resolution approach taken um, is subject to some sort of least cost test um, or some sort of financial cap. Uh, to ensure minimal um, cost to the financial sector, but also min minimal impact on the deposit insurance fund. So there are, uh, in many instances, a case of weighing up the different resolution options and working out whether it's cheaper just to liquidate the failed institution and reimburse depositors or to explore other resolution regimes. Now, the financial sector safety net um, more broadly composes more than just deposit insurers. It generally composes of these four different bodies, um, the central bank, the supervisor, resolution authority, and deposit insurer. So the central bank is probably the easiest one to explain, of course, um, prints banknotes, manages monetary policy, um, you know, many important, very fundamental roles um, in a financial system. Supervisor goes about um, monitoring um, licensed deposit taking institutions and, and potentially other financial service providers, um, ensuring that they are abiding by the, uh, the rules of the, the jurisdiction in question. The resolution authority is the institution that will go about um, managing failed um, institutions and finding ways to resolve them that is um, least, uh, well, least uh, with the fewer implications rather on, on financial stability and, and depositors um, and in different parts of the world these can be combined in different ways so often the central bank might also be a supervisor or also be a resolution authority and uh, the deposit insurer can be a resolution authority um, different configurations different places so in the uk the, the bank of england effectively takes all the top three uh, and then the deposit insurer is a separate um, a separate legal entity, but um, there are very different configurations all around the world. And, and our core principles look to capture all of those different um, ways of managing the financial safety net. So I did mention the UK, and this is the uh, the Royal Statistical Society. So um, I think it's appropriate we mention what happens in the UK. So the Financial Services Compensation Scheme um, is a member of IRD. Um, and they are the deposit insurer in the UK. So it's just important to note here, I don't represent their views at all. In fact, um, I'm going to not talk about them very much at all in this instance. I'll just say that they work very much in consultation with other financial um, sector safety net partners, um, you know, ultimately with the Bank of England and the PRA. And this box here, this is a purely a screenshot from the FSCS website. And um, you can see here that the coverage limit is £85,000, and that's per, per per person, per bank. And this includes, of course, building societies and credit unions as well. Um, there are provisions in place for those with temporary high balances. So that incorporates a situation where you might have, for instance, sold a, your family home and for a short amount of time have a, a large balance in your bank account. There are strict conditions on what, um, what qualifies for such protection, but they're in place as well to protect those that are not necessarily billionaires with lots and lots of funding in their bank account, but really merely engaging in a, a, a transaction um, and between um, significant asset purchases. And you'll notice here, again, it's, it's, a, it's a quote from the website, you don't need to do anything. So the FSCS will actually um, 
address a lot of these things automatically and look to to follow up with affected depositors and again it comes down to confidence it's all about ensuring that you have confidence um, in the in the bank or the uh, the credit union or building society that you uh, you engage with that um, your funding is covered up till this eighty five thousand pound limit now is that limit high enough well based on the two minutes of googling i did before this um meeting so finder.com's results suggest that um yeah, average saving in the uk and this is a heavily right skewed figure so it's definitely an overstatement in practice on what a what central um, a cent measure of central tendency for for savings in the uk would be um so here we've got britain rather eighteen thousand pounds on average savings uh for individuals so the the eighty five thousand pounds limit um has been chosen to cover a vast proportion of depositors um, and so um, those exceeding that cap are, are going to be very much in the minority but you know, this is just a bit of context here as to why that number might have been chosen so um that gets to a bit of the context and now i'm going to run through more statistics so deposit insurers uh, as i've alluded to design and they operate in lots of different ways so um, about half the deposit insurers around the world are legislated by governments but then also administered by civil servants um, others are administered by the central bank you'll see here roughly a quarter uh, and the remainders are administered by private institutions so the fscs for instance um, within the uk is a private institution but with a, a strong government mandate so um, yeah, lots of different ways that these things can be configured and we don't necessarily have a, a, a strong um, explicit uh, standard on, on what, what we feel is most appropriate through the, the core principles, but we um, want to ensure certain safeguards are in place regardless of the different approach taken. The different pros and cons of these different um, administrative arrangements. Another thing that's, um, from a statistical point of view that's really important here is the concept of the deposit insurer mandate and this is often a key disaggregation that we report on so it the mandate of a deposit insurer gets at uh, its powers what it's able to do um, the extent of its involvement in in resolution and monitoring deposit taking institutions we have four key mandates we have the pay box um, and this is an instance where a deposit insurer will maintain a fund and has the power to be able to reimburse insured depositors only. That is their only option in the event of a bank failure. Um, you have the Paybox Plus, where there's again additional responsibilities, so they could be contributing rather to a um, an alternative uh, resolution approach, uh, some sort of acquisition, or a number of other alternatives. Um, the funds that they manage can um, play into that and they can contribute to decision making to some extent. We have the loss minimizer and that's sort of um, more advanced again in terms of this deposit insurer weighing up a number of different um, resolution approaches and seeking to select a, a least cost um, strategy. And finally, we have the risk minimizer and this is uh, generally uh, assigned to deposit insurers that also have a formal supervisory role. Um, and so they have an ongoing um, responsibility to monitor, monitor deposit taking institutions, um, to intervene early, to take uh, preemptive measures, um, and to be fully involved in the, uh, the resolution um, efforts if, if a failure is to occur or a failure is um, imminent. So, Keep those four in mind because these will be very important for the graphs I'm about to show. Um, so the mandates over time have evolved. Um, we've seen that the pay box plus mandate is, is sort of slowly growing over time. So we found through our, our research that the, the role of deposit insurers in resolution activities is gradually growing and they're having greater involvement um, in choosing from different resolution measures. And so many deposit insurers now have a number of different tools in their arsenal beyond uh, simply liquidating and, um, and paying out uh, depositors. But um, this is sort of across the globe with the 
um, over the last say 10 years, um, we're seeing these trends emerge. So in terms of the role in resolution decision-making, there is a clear association between um, mandate and the, um, the extent of one's role. So we, we can see here that the dark blue is the situation where there's no input and with a pay box, um, we see that half of, half of the pay boxes really have no say whatsoever as to how um, a resolution should be um, put into place. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have a situation where nearly half of the risk minimizers are the sole authority responsible for deciding how a bank that uh, has reached this point of non-viability or is about to fail um, should be resolved. So this is just getting at some of the internal dynamics that are going on uh, within the financial sector safety net. And um, it also, I think it, it unpacks or it implicitly suggests that there's a considerable amount of consultation that goes on to ensure that the the right resolution tool is implemented um, for a given bank. On the uh, funding side, so um, ex ante funding is is overwhelmingly common. This this is merely a fund is collected in advance of any sort of um, of failure. There are a very small number of cases here. So that the ex post category here, four percent uh, of instances where um, funding will actually be accrued after a failure has occurred. They will still levy the banking system or the deposit taking institutions um, in scope, um, but it'll be after the fact. But that's that's increasingly less common. And indeed our core principles um, strongly encourage deposit insurers to have um, essentially a war chest, have funding set aside in advance, ready to go so that they can act extremely quickly um, when there are issues in the, in the banking sector in terms of failures. Um, in the event that uh, additional funding is need, needed, backup funding, um, there is a lot of planning that's in place to ensure deposit insurers have various lines of credit at play, ready to go if they need additional funding to help resolve a bank. Um, and you can see here that that can be a combination of, of public sources, um, arrangements with central banks or governments, uh, private sources um, going out to markets or, or leaving additional premiums on, on healthy banks um, or, or a combination. And so there is a lot of contingency planning going on behind the scenes during periods of relative stability to ensure that um, when a deposit insurer encounters macroeconomic conditions that are less favorable and, and, and failures are more likely that they are very much ready to go. Now, sort of back onto coverage, because coverage is very topical at the moment. I think it was worth just zooming in on this somewhat. Um, coverage, the selection of the coverage limit is a balancing act. So you do not want coverage too high or too low. It introduces issues on our, in either direction. It's about finding this sweet spot, so to speak. So if coverage is, is too low, I mean, depositors might not feel that they're appropriately protected. Um, if, if coverage is 1,000 pounds, I don't think many in the, in the UK would be very confident in that as a system to protect them in the event of failures. Um, so that calls into question confidence, um, which, which is really fundamental here. Um, if coverage is too low, there can be instances where that increases the likelihood of bank runs, not always the case. Um, and it can also, in, in some instance, instances, lead to um, a compromising of, of financial stability. Um, again, depending on jurisdiction specific circumstances. If the coverage limit is too high, we, we encounter this economic concept of moral hazard, which is undesirable behavior in this, in this instance by the deposit taking institutions. Um, so if the coverage limit is very high, the um, deposit taking institutions can have additional confidence that their mistakes will be essentially remedied by the deposit insurance fund, so to speak. And so it can lead to risk-taking behavior that supervisors don't feel is necessarily proportionate. So um, having too high a coverage can lead to some interesting behaviors um, in the financial sector. And so because of that, um, traditionally the approach has been to ensure that coverage is not too high. Um, 
So financial actors can question the credibility, of course, if you have a coverage level that's too high. They, many actors may just feel that the financing is not there, uh, the deposit insurer would not be capable of um, insuring deposits at that level in the event of a failure, and that's fair enough. So that gets into funding challenges. And if coverage is too high, you may be protecting depositors that really don't need the coverage per se. Um, so this gets into some almost moral arguments around what, what the purpose of deposit insurance is. But the other element here, of course, is that um, that addresses the protecting depositors objective. But when you're talking about protecting financial stability, um, high balance accounts can be tremendously important. And those with significant balances in an account, um, if they're not protected, that can also lead to broader systemic issues, um, depending on the particular circumstance. So it's a very challenging um, intellectual exercise. And there is significant deliberations, as you can imagine, about getting that coverage level just right. So beyond just the coverage level, we also have a number of other measures that we use. Um, so we have the coverage ratio. Um, and we measure that by both account and by depositor. So um, I'll, I'll present these because then I'll, I'll show some charts afterwards. But the coverage ratio by account essentially looks at what proportion of accounts are fully covered. Um, and ultimately, you want to select your uh, um, coverage level so that the coverage ratio by account and also by depositor is very, very high. Um, We'll see in a moment, in most cases, the coverage ratio by both account and depositor should be well over 90% um, to ensure that a vast majority of depositors within a given jurisdiction are fully covered. And it's only the highest um, balances that are exposed to a certain mar market discipline. Um, so um, that's, that's sort of a fundamental I issue at play there. And the other one that we look at is the coverage ratio by value. So this really just looks at what proportion of all deposits within a given system are insured versus those that are not insured. So um, we saw some interesting cases recently, for instance, with the, the Silicon Valley Bank in, in the US where 90% of deposits at that institution were not actually covered by the deposit insurance institution. Uh, it's because they were very high balance, uh, very high balance accounts. And, um, and that, then is something that needs to be considered by the deposit insurer and the resolution authority in terms of how you might resolve a bank in the event of a failure, which indeed um, was something that needed to be considered at the time. So these are useful metrics that we use in the industry to talk about the um, relative exposure of the deposit insurance um, fund. So we'll go through these a little bit quickly. We can see here that the uh, average coverage ratio uh, by depositor across all mandates is, is sort of well into the 90s in most instances, which is um, you know, by design. Um, by value, it's, it's roughly you know, globally around that 40% of deposits globally that are covered by deposit insurance. Um, and you can see that there's, there's certainly, on, on, on the right-hand side graph here, there's, there's definitely a, a geographic component at play um, in terms of coverage levels being much higher in Europe than they are, for instance, in Africa. Um, that's in part because coverage ratios um, can be higher in Europe compared to many jurisdictions in Africa. Um, across Europe, there is, a, there is a standard set out by Brussels within the EU of 100,000 euros, which is sort of broadly equivalent to the 85,000 pounds that you have in the UK. Um, and that covers yeah, an overwhelming majority of depositors and um, a very high amount by value as well. So this is just, again, just to give you a, it's a very short discussion we're having today, but really just to whet the appetite somewhat on, on some of the key statistical metrics that we're monitoring um, regularly. And it's often subject to much of our research, exploring the various dynamics here uh, on how they evolve over time and what the interesting disaggregations are. Um, so this is from a recent paper of ours, and it's looking at how the, uh, the coverage ratio by depositor um, is changing over time. So we've, we've gone through since 2015 here, and uh, with a very naive um, linear regression across the G7, we've seen uh, small growth um, in coverage ratios per depositor over time, but it's, it's, I mean, it's already starting from a very high level 
um, but this is just a sense of the degree of robustness that um, exists within the system at the moment. Um, those with typical, quote unquote, typical um, balances are, are comfortably covered by um, systems across a lot of, of the globe. And um, this is an important message, I think, to get across. This is more just to get a sense of the different um, configurations around the world. We see within, say, the G20 on the left-hand side, different levels of coverage. Um, these are all coverage limits in, in US dollars, um, contrasted against GDP per capita. Um, and so, yeah, there are just different models in place. Um, some are, are very, very conservative in, in the approach taken. Uh, we have the United States, for instance, that has a, a very high coverage level of 250,000 US dollars, but others such as India, Argentina are, are much lower. So um, really trying to unpack and, and highlight, I suppose, the variety um, of different designs um, that are in place for deposit insurers globally. This is looking at the, the share of covered and uncovered deposits that exist around the world. So the global median you can see here is um, sort of in the middle. Um, so 41% of deposits globally are covered. Um, and you can sort of see on either side of that, the different, um, the different cases in play here. So um, yeah, it's just, again, giving you a sense of different exposures, different, different sorts of um, different financial systems in play, different banking sectors, different incentives, um, and, and different exposures for deposit insurance, uh, deposit insurance frameworks within those jurisdictions. So um, all things to be conscious of and things that, again, we spend a lot of time monitoring. Um, I'll run through these last ones fairly quickly. I'm just getting to a couple of the real challenges in deposit insurance globally. So one of the standards uh, within our core principles says that deposit insurers should reimburse in the event of a reimbursement depositors, well, nearly all depositors within seven days. So that is viewed as a, a reasonable amount of time with which depositors should get their funds back um, through whatever mechanism that may be. Um, and we're seeing globally that roughly two thirds of depositors, uh, deposit insurers are able to begin that process within seven days. But uh, for many, it's, it's a real challenge around ensuring that they um, have all the information that they need to conduct, su successfully conduct a reimbursement, that they can garner the appropriate resources quickly, mobilize everything they need, get all relevant parties involved. And it's, it's a great challenge and something that the industry is continuing to work on, um, finding ways to reimburse faster, more effectively, um, and the utilization of merging technology, of course, is a, is a big part of that. One of the, the other big challenges here is about access to information. So generally speaking, well, it's just over half of deposit insurers are able to get information um, about the financial and deposit, deposit, deposit records um, before a bank is declared insolvent. So ideally, in order to be um, a particularly effective deposit insurer, you want to have a really strong sense at a granular level of um, the, the nature of depositors affected. So get a sense of which depositors um, are covered, to what extent, which ones have got uninsured funds associated with them, because then you can plan. And it's through that contingency planning that you can then um, take this information that has been provided in advance through potentially regular snapshots in conjunction with the supervisor and construct processes that enable reimbursement to occur more and more quickly. And so here getting access to information in a timely manner is something that the positive insurers are continuing to, uh, to grapple with uh, in many parts of the world. And, and, and in ARD, we're looking to support our members as they go through that, um, that process. I'll quickly highlight a, a paper that um, only went to out yesterday. So it's, it's really exploring this idea of uninsured deposits and uh, its relevance and, and how that concept has evolved over time. I would encourage you all to have a look at it if you can. Um, you can either head to the ARD website or, or head to my, I think the link to it on my LinkedIn page. So you're welcome to, to do either of those. Um, and then just to summarize, I'm conscious of the time here, 
I, I must stress that financial sector safety nets around the world are, are really more robust than ever before. So after the 2008 global financial crisis, significant reforms were put in play. Um, the Basel III reforms coming out of the Basel Committee uh, was substantial. The Financial Stability Board did a lot of really interesting work on too big to fail considerations, on um, ensuring that there is appropriate loss absorbing capital that is um, a requirement of, of insured institutions. And deposit insurers are more robust than they ever have been before. So yeah, there were, there were many lessons learned from the last crisis. Um, and as uh, policymakers continue to learn, they continue to adapt and look to um, improve things further. So there's still much to do, but the, um, the message here is that uh, depositors around the world should be confident that their financial safety, safety nets um, are working, they're effective, and they're looking to ensure that both depositors are protected, but also that um, financial sectors remain stable. So that's all, that's all the content, actually. I just thought I'd put a quick plug in for the um, the RSS <laughs> section here on, on finance and economics. So um, uh, much of this is on our website, but um, we welcome your continued engagement with us, of course. And um, yeah, I'll stop there to take any questions. Do, do we have any questions? Uh, uh, let me start. I think one of the things you mentioned is that some countries like the UK as sort of government stand, uh, so, so they would not do sort of deposit insurance at all or do they do it at certain level of money? How, how does that work when there is already a government sort of sort of initiative to to compensate depositors? Okay, well, I I think the, the key point here is that um, the protection of depositors is not something that just happens. I, th I think there are a lot of instances where um, people can be quite misinformed around the fact that their government will, government will just bail out um, any institution that encounters um, difficulties. And in most instances, that just won't happen these days. Um, there's been a, a fundamental shift away from those sorts of responses. So the construction of these deposit insurance frameworks where there is advanced planning, there is, um, you know, rule thinking about how to finance these sorts of resolutions. Um, I mean, these are increasingly in play within most jurisdictions. There are a, a small number of jurisdictions around the world without any deposit insurance where there is a some sort of blanket guarantee still in place by um, by governments, but they are increasingly rare. Um, so within within the UK, yes, you have this um, deposit insurer that is is working every day, looking to ensure that um, in the event of a bank failure, that they are able to protect depositors, and um, and there is a lot of work to ensure that they are able to again make sure they're well funded, but also um, respond in a in a timely manner. Um, the concern, of course, is that for low balance depositors, um, a couple of days without access to their funds could be quite significant. And so the ability to respond quickly by the deposit insurer is really important. Um, you also have a scenario where if, if, if a large institution is to fail, and occasionally that does happen, um, we've seen some interesting examples in recent mm -hmm. times, that there are very, very broad systemic implications that potentially are in play. And the concern is there that um, both the deposit insurer and um, the resolution authority, the central bank, the supervisor are all interested in working together to ensure that the failure of one institution does not lead to broader implications. And of course, in, a, in an increasingly interconnected world where financial flows move, move around the world very quickly, um, the failure of a, of a large institution in one part of the world could see um, many institutions in the other part of the, another part of the world also fail. So um, there's increasing coordination beyond borders as well. Um, central banks, of course, have, have long had um, a history of working together collaboratively to ensure that they're in achieving one objective, they're not compromising another. Um, yeah, deposit insurers, supervisors, resolution authorities are all looking to ensure that um, and global financial stability is retained. 
um, no matter how big the shock to the system. The, the system is remarkably robust at the moment in terms of what it can absorb. Um, here in Switzerland, um, we had a Credit Suisse arrangement where it, it was, it's an enormous bank, Credit Suisse. Yeah. And um, even though it encountered um, significant hardship, it is regarded as one of the global systemically important banks that was successfully able to be resolved. And through that, um, many other banks around the world didn't fail because many other banks had shares in Credit Suisse and um, <laughs> had um, considerable workings with them. And, and so there's lots of interconnections uh, within the global economy. So um, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots at play here. And um, I think that uh, our role is, is, is important. The work that we do in terms of ensuring that we're always looking to uh, strengthen the positive insurance framework, strengthen financial stability, safety nets more broadly, um, and ensure confidence in the system so that really so people can go about their day and not have to think a great deal about it. I mean, I have to think about it every day, but the, the, the plan is that the, the average punter, the average Joe, um, does not need to think a great deal about what would happen if their bank fails because there are support measures in place. We've got a com we've got a question in the comments. I don't know if you've seen it or do you want me to read it for you? Or... So the question is, what is your thought regarding the evolution of deposit insurance scheme? Are later implementers affected more by earlier imp implementers or more by their by their peers? So this two part question. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's a good question. Um, like any in industry, things are evolving. Um, essentially, every every uh, bank failure is different. Um, as a regulator, as a standard setter, you're always somewhat looking backwards, looking to um, regulate for the last crisis, regulate for the last failure to an extent. Um, but at the same time, you're always looking forward as well and trying to anticipate, well, what might be the key sources of risk moving forward? Um, Again, this, this noting of the increasing interconnection is really important. Um, financial stability risks are increasingly being considered given that the failure of even the middle, the medium sized bank can have broadly systemic implications um, depending on, on, on other dynamics at play there. There are a number of yeah, jurisdiction specific considerations as well. So financial systems, banking sectors across the world are all very different and um, deposit insurers need to be dynamic, need to be thinking very closely about the best way to design their framework to ensure that they can absorb risks um, where needed. Um, and um, of course, to, to look to ma make the most of emerging technologies, um, we are seeing some tremendous opportunities um, within the industry at the moment in terms of improving the way deposit insurers operate through a better utilization of technology. Um, and through forums such as the International Association of Deposit Insurers continue to share experiences and learn from each other. There are some amazing innovations in the deposit insurance space. And um, our role here in Switzerland is to help coordinate and, and shine a light on the, on the great successes so that um, jurisdictions um, across the world can learn and can ultimately take those lessons back to their jurisdiction and implement accordingly and hopefully get better. So I hope I've answered that question, Wesley. Thank you, Ryan. So with the development of, of uh, you know, fintechs and other kind of electronic depositors, how does this work? Is it the same setup like if it's a traditional bank or depositor taker or? It's another good question. Um, so the it depends. It really does depend. So there are some cases, for instance, in um, we say e money issuers, e money issuers, um, where in some cases they are actually included within their deposit insurance framework. So probably the most famous case of that is an e money issuer in in Africa um, called M-Pesa, um, subsidiary of Vodacom, a, a telecommunications company. And it is um, particularly popular in Kenya, 
And so the Kenyan Deposit Insurance Corporation has actually looked to incorporate that into the system. Um, Colombia also has a, a, a different, or well, a, a similar but different approach as well in terms of including e-money issuers um, within the framework. But um, but in most parts of the world, um, these fintech operators um, that are not licensed banking institutions or licensed deposit taking institutions rather, um, they are formally excluded. And so I think it's really important that as a consumer, you, um, you might do a little bit of your research in terms of ensuring that the product that you're in or the, the institution that you're engaging with um, has or, or doesn't have protection. So for instance, all cryptocurrency in almost every form is, is exclusively not covered by deposit insurance, it is not considered a deposit at all. Um, so that that's one where people can get very confused. And it's it's another part of the, the, the role of a deposit insurer in terms of going out and engaging with their constituents, um, their, the, the public within their jurisdiction to ensure that there's real clarity about what is covered and what isn't covered. It's not just you're covered to 85,000 pounds. It is, you know, these are the sort of institutions that are incorporated. Um, I know in some parts of the world, there are requirements that member institutions quite explicitly note to their customers that there is coverage. I know within the UK, there are FSCS banners that are put up in a lot of um, branches to try and underscore that, um, a particular institution does indeed have coverage, um, but um, but yeah, it's it's an ongoing discussion about to what extent some of these fintech operators are operating like a deposit taking institution, and as they become more and more integrated within financial um, systems, um, whether we have a situation where in some cases they can be formally included in a deposit insurance framework, but it's very much a case by case basis and something that um, is continuing to evolve. Generally speaking, deposit insurers are very um, picky about who, who gets included in the system and it's oh, licensed yeah. institutions, generally speaking. That's the, that's, that's the default position, I dare say, yes. Okay. Uh, if there is a last question, or oh, we are almost out of time. If not, I thank Ryan for a very interesting talk. I did not know about this topic at all, actually. And that was very, very eye-opening, actually. So thank you very much. No, thank you so much for, to you and to, and to the listeners for their time. Very much appreciated. Thank you.